Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. And so he named that place Lachan Machanaim. So, Lord, as we look at this this morning in the balance of the chapter, we pray your blessing on the reading and the teaching of your word. And may we have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. Last week we started in Isaiah chapter 43 and made our way to <clears throat> Genesis 32 here. And we asked the question, are you a Jacob or an, uh, an Israel? And this morning I want to follow up on that and ask the question, are you living in Machanaim or in Peniel? And that hopefully will be made plain as we go through here. So Jacob has, uh, he, he had to leave uh, Canaan because he had stole the blessing and the birthright of his brother Esau from his father Isaac. Esau said, I'm going to kill that guy when our father dies. And um, Jacob got wind of the fact that Esau wanted to kill him. And so he ran away to Syria to where his uh, uncle was. And he uh, married uh, Leah and Rachel, uh, two cousins. And so uh, he was there for 20 years. And now he's making his way back into Canaan. And he knows that he left behind him an angry brother, a, a brother who had sworn to kill him. And so he's making his way back into Canaan. And as he makes his way back, he has here at Machanaim, he has a revelation of God's presence. The angels meet him. And, and, and they're saying, like, listen, Jacob, as you're coming back to, uh, into the land of Canaan, you're going to be facing your brother. We want you to know that we're with you and God's power is with you. So Jacob here, he had a revelation of God's presence. He saw how the invisible became visible. And he called the place Machanah. Machanah in the Hebrew means camp. Whenever you put an I-M, uh, when you ever see an I-M in the Old Testament, that's their way of putting an S that's the way of pluralizing a word. And so Machanaim, this is two camps. I, I, see, I see man and I see God. And so we call the place Mach, Machanaim. And this is like God saying to Jacob, listen, Jacob, I've got you. You're going back into a place where you're fearful. You're going back into a place where you're anxious. You're not sure what's going to be happening. I want you to know that I've got you. And so the lesson of Machanaim is this. God is with me. Trouble's on the way. Trouble's on the way, but God is with me. And all of you, all of us, you've had trouble come your way. Marriage, family, health, finances, career, depression, addiction, and you can multiply all of these categories. You've had trouble come your way, but God has shown up. And God says, I've got you. As, you. as you walk through this thing, as, as, you, as you face that which is coming at you that you're afraid of, I want you to know that, that I've got you. Probably all of you who name the name of Jesus, you've been to Machanaim. At one time or another, God has shown up in your life and said, I, I've got you. And that's a wonderful thing to happen. Normally, Sunday morning, can be a machanaim for so many people. Either through uh, the, the preaching of the pastor or through the worship, God meets you in a special way, or, or out in the lobby as you fellowship or in prayer with somebody. But God just shows up and God says, I've got you. And there's just this glorious comfort that comes your way. There's a peace that passes understanding. You can't describe it. You can't articulate it. You really can't define it. All I know is God's with me. And, and what I thought I couldn't walk through, I can walk through now. But something happened to Jacob. Verse 3. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, which is to the southeast of the Dead Sea there. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau. Now he's calling him Lord. You know, uh, he wants to, wants to make a good impression on his brother as he's coming back into the land. Because again, Esau, 20 years ago, had vowed to murder him. 
Uh, thus says God, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find, that I might find favor in your sight. I'm coming your way. Are you mad? Are you still mad? You know. Are you still upset with me? I want to find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you with the 400 men that are with him. And Jacob went, uh-oh, uh-oh. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. And so this revelation that he had at Machanaim, it was wiped out by the report he got there in verses 3 through 8. The approach of Esau wiped out the revelation of Machanaim, and all Jacob saw now was the threat. In verses 1 and 2, he saw a company of angels. In verses 1 and 2, he virtually heard God saying to him, don't worry, I've got you. But now trouble coming his way, it wipes out everything that, that he had learned, everything that he had experienced there in Machanaim. It's interesting that um, in verse 2, it talks about Machanaim, two camps. In verse 7, my, my Bible, the last word there is that uh, he divided the camels and the herds into two companies. That's the same Hebrew word. There were two camps in verse, in verse 2. God was there and man was there, you know, joined together, camping out together. And God says, I've got you. Now in verse 7, there's two camps, but there's no God. It's just one camp of men and another camp of men. And this threat looming, this threat coming his way, was enough to rob him of his assurance of the presence of God. Jacob had put his hope in God, but now he's trusting in himself again. He's trusting in his own ability to handle the situation. Hey, Esau's coming my way. Well, instead of saying, oh God, I know you've got me. You promised me. And he's still in Machanaim. He's still in that place where the angels showed up and revealed heaven to him. He's still in that place. And what he should have done, if I can be a... Uh, uh, an armchair quarterback about 3,000 years later, what he should have done is saying, God, you know, Esau's on his way with 400 guys. That sounds a little bit ominous to me, but you made a promise to me. And I, I praise you that you're with me. I praise you that you're for me. I know that you can do what you've promised. Now, I think that's what he should have done, but instead he begins to scheme again as we're going to see a little bit further on here. You know, uh, church is like Machanaim. God shows you so much, but by Monday morning, that revelation is wiped out, and you no longer see God. You just see those things that are against you. And on a Sunday morning, during the preaching of the Word or in any of the part of the service, God stirs you to faith. God stirs you up. And you come to the realization, I haven't been treating my wife the right way. I haven't been treating my husband the right way. Man, I, I need to be more of a, a, a presence in my kid's life. Or I, I'm going to be a better witness at work. I, I'm, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to serve more. I'm going to give more. All, all of these things. I'm going to overcome this stronghold in my life, this addiction, this thing that has a, that has a grip on my soul. Things are going to be different this time. Just you wait and see. God met me at Calvary Chapel, Fremont. And I'm leaving this place full of faith, full of excitement, full of enthusiasm to live my life for Christ. And then what happens? Monday comes. <laughs> the wife doesn't respond to you the way you think she should. Uh, your husband doesn't uh, uh, treat you the way that he thinks that you think he should. You're all set to witness to so-and-so at work, but uh, when he shows up, all your resolve just, you know, kind of,
kind of uh, fritters away on all those things that you would resolve to do in the presence of the Lord on a Sunday morning, it's all dissipated by Monday. That's what's happening with, uh, with uh, Jacob here. Reality swallows revelation. I think this is where we got that phrase, reality bites, right there. <laughs> reality swallows revelation. God spoke to me so clearly. But now the shadow of man, the shadow of threat, the shadow of all these things, my life, it smothers out, it drowns out. It, uh, it hides the revelation, the revelation of God. You know, it's easy to forget the lessons of Machanaim. And he's still, he's still at, at Machanaim. He's still in that geographical place. But he forgot what God had showed him. And he's overwhelmed with fear now, as we're told there in verse 7. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and so he divided the people. He didn't look to God. He began to scheme and to strategize and to figure his way out of the problem that he found himself in at that time. I'm surrounded by a glorious revelation of God, and then I'm smothered by my problems. And we can be exactly like Jacob. The revelation of Machanaim is all forgotten, and we, now, we have to figure things out on our own now. I've got to deal with this husband. I've got to deal with this wife. I've got to deal with this boss. I've got to deal with these finances. And I'm all on my own, you know. And what kind of clever strategy can I come up with now? And Jacob forgot what God had showed him. But in verse 9, uh, he begins to pray for deliverance. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham uh, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two companies. Deliver me. Here's the substance of his prayer now. Deliver me, I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him that he will come and attack me uh, and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. And so there in verses 9 through 12, Jacob begins to pray, and it's good. This is always a good thing, that God promises you something, and you go, hallelujah, praise God. And then, you know, your trouble comes your way. Trouble comes your way. And, and, and your faith is swallowed by fear. But Jacob goes, I know what to do. I'm, I'm just going to pray. And so he begins to pray to God, and he asks to be delivered from the thing that he fears. Now, this is a good prayer, but his prayer is too small. God just doesn't want to deliver him from the fear of Esau. He wants to deliver Jacob from fear itself. Not just the fear of Esau, but from fear itself. What, what, what's better, to be delivered from the things that cause you fear, or to be delivered from fear itself? To be delivered from fear itself. If I'm only delivered from the things that cause me fear, then I'm, I'm going to have to avoid a lot of things. Dogs, High places, shopping malls, uh, 880. Uh, there's so many things that, that you're going to have to avoid if, 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 if God only delivers you from the fears of those things that you don't uh, uh, like, you're going to have to avoid so many things. But when you're delivered from fear itself, if I'm delivered from fear itself, I can go anywhere and I can walk through anything. Jacob's prayer is good. Deliver me from the hand of my brother Esau. But it doesn't go far. God, God wants to do far beyond all that Jacob can ask and think. And I know this because of the promise in the New Testament, but also by how the chapter 20, uh, 32 ends here, as we're going to get to. God, God wants to deliver Jacob from so much more than he prays. 
And I, I would suggest to you that you pray good, good prayers. But in the scheme of things, they're puny prayers. You, you don't have a little God for little problems. You have a big God for big problems. And, 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 and Jacob just focuses on one thing, and I understand because this is a thing that's dominating his, his psyche at the time. This is a thing that's overwhelming to him. But God wants to do above and beyond all that we can ask or think. And I think the Lord would say, hey, that's a good prayer, Jacob. But I've got a lot more. I've got a lot more in mind for, for you. If I'm delivered from fear itself, I can go anywhere. I can walk through anything. You know, the company of angels that Jacob saw filled him with faith, but the coming of Esau filled him with faith. It drained him of faith, and it filled him with, uh, with fear. See, God, just, God doesn't just want you to be filled with peace and confidence when you see him, but also when you see the enemy. Not just when I look at him, but when I see the enemy in front of me. And I'm not talking about your husband, okay? <laughs> those things that are out to destroy your faith, those things that are out to rob you of joy. You know, David said, I could, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? You. You are with me. So often, what do we do when we're in the valley of the shadow of death? I'm looking for the exit. I, I want to retreat. I want to get out. But David said, I, I don't fear any evil. You're with me. And there's also something implicit in Psalm 23, which would say that David walking through the valley of the shadow of death, this was God's will for David. Because the psalm starts out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I think Psalm 23, 1, I think that's the conclusion. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I think that's the conclusion. And there's different psalms where he puts the conclusion at the first. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I feed on the word of God. He leads me beside the quiet waters. I'm drinking of the Holy Spirit. He restores my soul. Then he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God is leading me into the valley of the shadow of death. This isn't some aberration. I don't need to think, oh, where did I take a wrong turn? When I go through trouble, when I go through trial, when I go through depression, when I go through the difficulties of life, what did I do wrong? You're doing nothing wrong. You're following the shepherd. And so if I'm following the shepherd and Jesus is leading me through the valley of the shadow of death, that's his path for me. Why would I want anything that's not his path? I might prefer something else, even like Jesus in the garden. Lord, let it be, be your will. Let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to go to the cross. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy be done. And if this is the path you have for me, I'll walk down it. So I, I want to be able to look at my, my, my fiercest enemy, the most difficult challenges, and, 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 and be able to be filled with faith even while looking at those things that are against me. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And Abraham, without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body now as good as dead. He's 100 years old. And what that meant was he didn't have the sperm count to, to, to sire a child. Uh, he, he had children before, but his body was good as dead now. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, his wife's womb, she was 90 years old. She had been barren her whole life. And God says, you, Abraham, are going to have a child with, uh, with uh, Sarah. It's not going to be a virgin birth. You guys are going to be intimate. And, and, and Abraham goes, well, okay, but I, you know, uh, I, I, I don't have any potency within myself. And Sarah, she hasn't been able to have kids her whole life. He looked, he looked right at the problem. Yet without becoming weak in faith, 
he began to praise God, knowing that what God had promised, God could bring about. You don't have to run from your enemy. You don't have to retreat, you know, away from him. You can look at your problem right in the eye and be delivered from fear. Um, Abraham had no fear when he looked at, well, this is what God has to work with. And I, my body is dead. My reproductive capacity is dead. Sarah's reproductive capacity is dead. But God said he would do it. So God's going to do it. So even death, he, he looked at death, and it didn't bring out fear in him. He, he was able to walk into the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Not Jacob, though. Jacob's not there yet, but God wants to bring Jacob to that place where he doesn't fear anything, and he can walk anywhere because he knows that God, he knows that the Lord is with him. Um. David, you know, he came up against Goliath. And he looked his enemy straight in the face. Straight in the face. And the whole camp of Israel, the whole army of Israel behind him, he, he could hear them chattering in their army, you know, just, just with fear. This, this, this great cacophony around him with the, with the army, you know, just uh, filled with fear. Because they didn't want to fight Goliath. He was like nine feet tall. Giant. And... Uh, he went out and he said, you come to me with a spear and a sword and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the living God. And God will remove your head from you this day. He looked right at the enemy. And where I would look at someone like Goliath and go, ah, what am I doing? What a fool I was to tell Saul I could take this guy on. But David was just filled with faith. Even when he looked in the face of the enemy. And I believe that God would have each of us there to be able to, to, to walk anywhere in the name, in the name of, of the Lord. Where the, the, the coming of trouble doesn't fill me with fear. And what David basically said to Goliath, he says, my God is bigger than you. My God is better than you. My God is better than you. And you come to me. We can say to the enemy, we can say to life, you come to me with death and disease and death and depression, but I live in the name of the living God. And when these things come at me, of course, you know, if, if, I, got, if I got a, um, uh, a diagnosis of, Tim, you have cancer, um, of course it would affect me. I'd go, well, that's a bummer. You know, I wonder, wonder how deep it is and how long it's been going on, blah, blah, blah. But I hope I wouldn't curl up in a fetal position in the doctor's office and, you know, they'd have to take me off for a 5150 somewhere to go to a mental hospital because I'm wiped out. Hopefully, I'd be able to look at that diagnosis in the face. Well, actually, I have been uh, uh, diagnosed with cancer before. I've had different cancers cut off my body. Not like Robert. Now, Robert has a story. But I want you to know that Robert went through that. He went through that like David coming up against Goliath. Uh, of course, there, there was a bummer that he had it, and who wants to go through that? But he was filled with faith Amen. the whole time. He was filled with faith the whole time. And he just wasn't delivered from the fear of, uh, of cancer or the fear. Of the, he was delivered from all fear, which means I can go through anyway go through anything, and I can walk anywhere. I live, David would say, in the living name of God. My God is able, David said to those things that came against him. And this is where God wants us to be. But unfortunately, Jacob isn't there in our story. Look at verse 13. Verses 13 through 23 describe how Jacob prepares to meet his brother uh, Esau. So Jacob spent the night there, and then he selected from what he had. He spent the night at Machanaim, and then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 milking camels in their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of the servants. Every drove 
by itself and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going and to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob as a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he, Jacob, is also behind us. And then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. Obviously, buttering up his brother, right? Trying to soften up his brother. I've told you before about the cannibal who was sent home from school for buttering up his teacher. <laughs> You're going to tell it over lunch today. I know you are. So. That's, that's, what, that's what Jacob is doing here. He's, but, he's buttering up his brother here. And um, verse 19, uh, verse 20, And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face, and perhaps he will accept me. Uh, now he arose the same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent whatever he, uh, he and he sent across whatever he had. And so in verses nine through twelve, Jacob, Jacob prays for deliverance from what the things that he fears, but now he's still filled with fear that prayer didn't work. It didn't work for Jacob, right? Because he's not filled with faith. He's not trusting in the Lord. He puts this strategy, he puts this plan together. And, you know, he's going to butter up his brother Esau. And you notice verse 20. He says, I will appease him, my brother. Perhaps, maybe, he will accept me. So even after Machanaim and the revelation there of God's promise, and even after praying the promise and the power of God in verses 9 through 12, Jacob is not certain that God will come through. He's still living in doubt, in fear. And I know so many of your, so many of your stories intersect with Jacob's here. God has promised you so much in his word. You, 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 could, you can repeat and, and, and from memory quote so many of the promises in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But it doesn't cause you not to live in fear. And you've prayed, you've sought God, you've cried out to God for your problem, just like Jacob did. And yet, it hasn't delivered you from fear. So many in the church, I believe the majority of the church, can identify with Jacob's uh, biography right here, can identify with Jacob's struggle and trying to walk with God through the stuff of life and to have faith in the midst of difficulties so he's still living in doubt and fear. See, I, I don't want to live in the perhaps of my plans. I want to live in the power of God's promise. But all, David, all Jacob had was, I will appease him. Meaning, I'll get him off my back with all of the, you know, all the flocks and all of the herds and all of the wealth that's coming his way. And Esau might think, hey, it's in my best interest to keep this, this kid alive, you know. He'll enrich me. Perhaps, maybe, it'll work. So instead of, you know, standing on the rock-solid promise of God's word, God's going to come through for me. He's trying to figure it out on his own now. And maybe, maybe. And he's living in the perhaps of his own plans. Jacob's revelations of God, his prayers to God, haven't yet molded a man who trusts in God. And... You know, you can hear all kinds of sermons and you can pray, pray all kinds of prayers and yet not be a man, not be a woman who trusts in the Lord. If that doesn't mold you to be a man of God, to be a, a woman of God, what will? Verses 24 through 32. And then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, 
for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said to, to the man who wrestled with him, which we know to be the angel of the Lord, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so the angel said to him, what's your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. My name is heel catcher. My name is deceiver. And, and the angel said to him, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket. He dislocated his hip uh, at the sinew. Of, of the hip. So here, uh, Jacob, uh, um, Jacob depended upon his own plans in order to placate um, his brother Esau. But this is a strategy of a man who, who really is no longer living in Machanaim. No longer does he have this vision of God in front of him. He's lost that. And he goes, i got to figure this out on my own now. Now, the first thing I want to note here in, in uh, this last portion is verse 24 there, the first part, Jacob was left alone. Um, and I think that Jacob was left alone because if uh, someone was with him, they would have helped him. I mean, wouldn't you? Wives, if you know, you're sitting at the campfire with your husband and just someone jumps out from the trees and jumps on your husband... Uh, You'd probably, you'd probably do something, I would hope so, you know. Get the, get the axe or <laughs> uh, repellent spray and try to spray him in the eyes or something. Uh, God, God left him alone because he wanted no one to help him. You know, there are just some things you have to go through alone. And even though we talk about the wonderful fellowship and the prayers that we can have with one another and the the sharing with one another and carrying each other's burdens. There's just some things you have to go through alone. I'm amazed when I hear about um, uh, a Christian wife whose marriage isn't what uh, it should be, isn't what she wants it to be, and she's seeking God about it and just wrestling with God about her marriage. And she tells a girlfriend, a Christian girlfriend, of her struggles with her husband. And that Christian girlfriend says, leave the guy. You know, God wants you, God wants you to be happy. Forget about the kids, forget about your husband, forget about your covenant oath. God wants you to be happy. And your individual happiness uh, overshadows the, the covenant vow that you made, which now includes your kids because they're under that, that covenant cloud, uh, if you would. God wants you to be happy. And, and I, I wish that Christian wife struggling with her husband just would have shut up. Because th this, is, this is tantamount to someone jumping you know, on this angel and trying to wrestle him off. God, God wanted Jacob to wrestle with this. And you know when you wrestle, it's not like boxing, even though boxing is, is exhausting. With wrestling, you use every part of your body. Your hands, your fingers, your forearms, your neck, your legs, uh, your teeth sometimes, you know. Uh, <laughs> but everything is in. And God's wrestling with some of you right now about a specific thing in your life. And I, I would suggest to you that unless you have a real assurance and confidence that you, should, that you should share that with someone else, don't. You need to be alone with God in that thing, that he can have your full attention in it. Um, so here's Jacob. He's left all alone at the brook Jabbok, which he then uh, renames Peniel, which means the face of God. 
and he's all alone. So I asked the question, why does God wrestle with Jacob at this time? Why now? Didn't Jacob need this experience with God before in his life? Didn't Jacob need to be touched this deeply at, at different junctures of his life and of his biography and of, of his story? And I believe this, that God didn't wrestle with Jacob before because Jacob was never overwhelmed before. This coming of Esau with 400 men, and Jacob doesn't know the intention of Esau. He doesn't know if Esau is friendly or if Esau is hostile. He doesn't know if Esau has been placated or if Esau is breathing out threats against him still. If he's still offended by what happened 20 years previously when he was ripped off by Jacob. Jacob doesn't know. He's never been overwhelmed before. If you know the story, we're not going to rehearse the whole thing, but he outsmarted his brother Esau. He outwitted his father Isaac, and he outmaneuvered his uncle Laban. He knows how to get his way. He knows how to bend people to his will. He knows how to wiggle through problems. He knows how to go underneath them or over them or around them or through them. He's never been stopped before. But this time, He's overwhelmed. And it's like the Lord says, all right. You're right where I want you to be. Helpless, hopeless, thrashing around. And you might think that, hey, I'm a child of God. God would never want me in that place. Oh, dear. <laughs> How God's been waiting for you to get to that place. Because channels within your soul are open that have never been opened before. Ears are open that have never been opened before. And a humility is open that has never been there, or a, a humility is evident that's never been there before. And so, why, why didn't God just show up, though, here at the brook Jabbok and say, hey, uh, uh, Jacob, I've got you. You're going to meet your brother Esau tomorrow. Don't worry. I, I, I've got you. I think this, that Jacob didn't need to have another revelation of God. He needed to live in revelation. He just didn't need to have another revelation. Oh, yeah, thanks, God, for reminding me. I forgot, you know, my bad, sorry. You were, you're good to me, Lord. He just need, didn't need to have another revelation. He needed to live in Revelation, and I believe that this is your need also. After wrestling, Jacob didn't need revelation in each place he went from here on in because he was living in Revelation. I want to talk about that just for, for a minute, a moment. When you see God face to face, you can meet trouble face to face. This is why Abraham could look at his body now as good as deadness, deadness of Sarah's womb and not grow weak in faith, but. Uh, uh, wax strong in faith by giving glory to God. The, the enemy, that which was against him, his own body, it didn't trip him up. David could look at Goliath and, and not, be, not be freaked out because he was living in the revelation of God. Uh, Abraham was living in the revelation of God. As David went through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll fear no evil. Why? He's walking with the Savior. He's living in the revelation of God. Every step, because God dislocated his hip, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Every step that Jacob took, it reminded him of the God of Peniel. He, he didn't need a revelation to be given to him, a dream or a vision or a word, because Every time he walked, he was reminded of the power of God. My God can do anything. My God touched me in the deepest way. And now it's within him, not just before him, not just in a moment of time, not just a, a, a memory that can fade away. Every step he took, he was reminded of the God who overcame him. Every step he took, he was reminded of the God of Peniel. He'd seen God face to face. I want to be in that place that when I face challenges, trouble comes against me, I'm not saying, oh, God, where are you? Give me a word in this place. But I'm living in Revelation. 
And I know my God can do anything. I'm not wiped out by the circumstances I find myself in, those things that are against me, or the challenges that I face. I know that God is with me. Um, Machanaim is having a revelation while Peniel is living in revelation. Are you living in Machanaim or Peniel? That was the name, the title of the message. And hopefully you can get this distinction I'm talking about. I don't think it's some kind of super spiritual, mystical kind of line I'm drawing here. It's something that happened with Jacob. Because now every place Jacob went, again, every step he took, he was reminded of the God who can do anything. The God who is with him wherever he goes. We don't have time to go into it, but you can read on in chapter 33 and ask yourself, how, did, how was Jacob's life different after Peniel than it was before? How, how did he walk these things out? So you, there's a knowledge that comes from revelation. You know, God's showing you stuff. And there's a knowledge that comes from presence. He's with me. He's with me. Well, did he give you a word? What did God say about, about your cancer, about your debt, about your depression? Well, no, I, I don't have any specific word outside of what he said in the, in, the, in the Bible. I just know he's with me. My God is with me. And that's enough. That, that's, that's enough. The word of God to Jacob became the work of God in him. And the work of God in him became his walk. And every time, again, he took a step, he was reminded of the Word of God and the work of God. He was broken, but he wasn't crushed. He was surrendered, but he wasn't shattered. And I would suggest to you that as we see Jacob living away from the brook Peniel, that's how every Christian should walk. God has touched me. God, God has broken the flesh in me, if you would. God has taken away my fear. And I can walk in anything and I don't have to be afraid of anything. Now you'll notice one other thing here before I bring this to a close. Um, verse 26 of chapter 32. Then uh, the angel said to Jacob, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. Why, why was the angel concerned with daybreak? And I believe it's this, that God wanted Jacob to learn lessons of faith in the dark. He wanted victory before the break of day. You know, you're waiting for sunrise, but God's waiting for surrender. Yeah, I just want this thing to be over with. You know, my mother-in-law's here for five days, you know, and <laughs> I can put up with that, you know. I just want the thing to be over. And God wants to touch you. You're waiting for sunrise, but God is waiting for surrender. You're waiting for the thing to be over. And God's waiting for you to know Him and to surrender yourself to Him. And now here with Jacob, you know, with him surrendering, he's clinging to God. He's clinging to the angel of the Lord. He's hungering for Him. He's crying out to Him. And when you hunger for God, when you cling to God, when you cry out to God, <clears throat> that's evidence that you've been to Peniel. Not only to Machanaim, which we see all the time. I, I can read my Bible. I, I can open the Word and just in devotions, the God of Machanaim re reveals Himself to me. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. But it's that work of God deep within your soul that says you've been to Peniel. So, are you living in Machanaim or Peniel? You've been to Machanaim. Won't you come to Peniel? And when God begins to wrestle with you about your attitude, and all, and all of this is not super spiritual, mystical stuff. This has to do with your, how you deal with your husband, your wife, your kids, your neighbors, uh, your, your, your extended family, the church family, your boss, your fellow employees. Uh, this has to do with just mundane stuff, if you would. This isn't some kind of uh, uh, super, super crisis. It's God seeking to secure in me an obedience that's deeper than what I've given so far. Something that's going to hurt me. 
Because husbands, maybe you need to humble yourself before your wife and, and apologize and repent. Ooh, but that's going to hurt. Good. Or wives, same thing. Honey, I'm so sorry. I said this, I did that. Well, that's going to hurt. And, and he's going he's gonna, to, you know, lord it over me. Well, let it hurt. It hurt Jacob to be dislocated. This has to do with mundane stuff as you give deeper and deeper obedience to Jesus Christ. You've been to Machanaim. Come to Peniel. And, you know, um, well, we've been married 47 years. Um, I've probably repented 4,700 times, you know. <laughs> and just, just to live in repentance. Uh, so now every time I see Fran, I'm, I, I don't know what I did, honey, but I'm sorry. No, <laughs> that's being servile. But uh, to, to know that um, that's been touched in my heart. And, and I, I can humble myself before my wife, and it's not fatal. Jacob now could go without all of his, uh, without all of his strategy. He can go before Esau, and it's not fatal. Because I know God has touched me, and I know that God is with me. And so he called the place Peniel. Pene means face. El is God. I've seen God face to face. I've seen the face. Of God. That's what Peniel means, the face of God. I've seen God face to face. And you might think, oh, that'd be so awesome to see God face to face. <clears throat> Jesus said to Philip, Philip said to Jesus, um, show us the Father and it's good enough for us. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everybody that, that, that saw Jesus uh, uh, disciple, non-disciple, follower, non-follower. They didn't know it, but they were looking at God face to face. And if you don't know Jesus here this morning, you can see God face to face in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you on the cross. Jesus gave his life for you. Because your sins have made a separation between you and God. And there's nothing you can do that will commend yourself to God. There's nothing you can do that will impress God. I won ten gold medals. God says, I, I can win a million gold medals. You know, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing that, that I can't do? What are you doing that, that will impress me? There's nothing you can do that would commend your heart to God. He just loves you. He created you, and now he wants to redeem you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ here in this place this morning, this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to open your heart to Jesus. And you listening at home on live stream, you can give your life to Christ here this morning also. Paul the Apostle said that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessed Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. And if you've never done that before, You've never publicly acknowledged that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessed him as Lord. I would invite you right now just to stand up where you're uh, seated. And at home, you can stand up also. And by doing that, you're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Would you pray for me, Pastor Tim? I would love to lead you in a prayer this morning of you confessing the resurrection of Jesus and the Lordship of Jesus in your life. Anybody here, you need to do that. Today is the day of salvation, Paul said. Don't harden your heart. Respond to the Holy Spirit today. Is there anybody here? I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your glory. And Lord, may everyone in this room who hasn't been to Peniel, may they come to Peniel, Lord. And may they have that deep working of your Spirit in their lives so that they don't have to be afraid of anyone, anywhere, or anything.
because, God, you walk with them. We love you, Jesus. And in your name we pray, amen. Amen.